The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. Um, and I see some new faces here in the Zoom room, and I imagine there's a uh, new people uh, watching or listening right now. So what is the STOA? Um, no one really knows. Some people call it a digital campfire or communal podcast. Uh, we have a wisdom gym here with events that have uh, badass titles like existential dance party, shame breakthrough boot camp, flowing with unknowingness. Uh, you can all check that out at the, the stoa.ca if you're one thing this place is not is a place to talk about stoicism. <laughs> There's only like 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 two stoics here, and it's like me and someone else. Um, we talk about everything else though, um, including uh, the topic today: settler sexualities. And we have Professor uh, Kim Tallbear today, which um, our MC today, maybe Gray, will introduce in a moment. And uh, maybe Gray is our meta modern sex columnist here at the Stoa. And if you have no idea what that means, neither do I. But I think maybe knows. Um, so. That being said, I'm going to take maybe in and she's going to introduce Kim and uh, the Q&A protocols for the day. Uh, so maybe uh, you are up. Hey, everybody. So excited to see you here. If this is your first time, uh, I hope it's not going to be the last time I see you. Looking forward to your faces being familiar, too. Uh, we're here today with anthropologist and professor at the U of A Native Studies Department, Kim Tallbear. She's also a creative writer at the criticalpolyamorous.com and Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Techno Science and Environment. Now I'm going to pass it off to Kim in a moment here to let her uh, give herself a little bit of an overview uh, of what she has to share with you today. But I just want to let you know that we will be moving uh, right into questions from the audience after that. So while she's speaking, feel free to leave your questions in the chat, put a little cue or question before. So I'm uh, aware that that you're addressing uh, the the question period. And if uh, you don't want to appear on YouTube, uh, this, uh, this podcast is being recorded. So if you'd prefer, I can read your question for you, just put that in brackets or message your question privately to me if that's a concern for you. Uh, so without any uh, further ado, Kim Talbert, I would, I would love to pass it off to you uh, to give us your opening presentation. Great, so I have muting and unmuting capability, okay. Um, it's nice to be here, thanks for having me. I wish I could pour a glass of wine, but I have to go to the grocery store after this. So um, I'm gonna read to you uh, just the intro to a chapter that I have in press right now because it links my longstanding work that I'm most well known for on uh, genetic ancestry testing and critiques of biological or genetic fetishization related to indigenous uh, belonging. Um, it connects that to my newer work on critical polyamory, um, which you can find some of the embryonic thinking around critical polyamory on my website, uh, criticalpolyamorous.com, but I have also published some uh, academic stuff uh, out of that work. I've got a new book in the works related to that. Um, and, uh, oh, I kind of forgot to introduce, oh, you introduced me, right? So I don't need to do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, um, I should say I'm Sistan Wapton Oyate, which is a Dakota people in the northeast corner of uh, uh, South Dakota. So I have been in Canada for a little over five years now. Um, but so this, uh, this, the, what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna read to you and present to you for just a few minutes uh, makes the link between the gene fetishism critiques and my critiques of other forms of settler relating. Uh, which in here in compulsory monogamy. Uh, and, the, and so this uh, intro will get into that. And then I think we're gonna mostly do a Q and A, which I really love. So um, rather than just talking to you. So this chapter that's coming out is got a really boring title and I'm hoping that the press, it's Rutledge Press that's doing a volume on critical global indigenous studies will sexy up the title, but probably not because academics are not good at that, right? So if you have any ideas, I'd happily take them. But right now it's called identity is a poor substitute for relating. And so a lot of times when I use the word identity, think about scare quotes around it. 
And then the subtitle is, uh, this is the very unsexy part, genetic ancestry, critical polyamory, property and relations. So in 2013, the same year that my book, Native American DNA, a Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science was published, I also started a then anonymous blog called The Critical Polyamorist which I intended as a way to find and think with like-minded others about how this new turn in my personal life, my engagement with consensual non-monogamy with multiple partners. Um, so to think about that turn in my life. Uh, this was challenging and time consuming to figure out how to build good relationships and good uh, relations in ways that go against the system that spans legal and contemporary cultural orders at all levels. If you're gonna kind of buck the system, this is not um, something you do quickly or easily. So I started writing the Critical Polyamorous blog because I wanted to be sure that my polyamory practice was informed by and supported my broader anti-colonial worldview before I went and did polyamory open, openly in the world. I was open, of course, with my partners. If I were going to make a life-altering transition to consensual non-monogamy, it was essential that I make it into research or I, otherwise I just wouldn't have the time. I don't really do work-life balance, so. So writing The Critical Polyamorous was not the first time I pursued study in order to think and live in resistance to colonial inheritances. 12 years earlier in 2001, I put on hold a career in indigenous environmental and science policy to pursue a PhD in academic research. And I wasn't getting a PhD as a new career path. I didn't intend to stay in the university, but rather as a way to understand the professional and cultural worlds that I moved through. So I originally, when I started that PhD uh, at the University of California, Santa Cruz in history of consciousness, I planned to just come in, uh, write the dissertation and go back to uh, in governmental and environmental policy work post PhD. Um, I was working for national tribal organizations then, or especially around energy and environment. I did a lot of um, liaison work between tribes and the uh, um, federal government and uh, nuclear waste facilities. So the it, cultural and environmental implications of nuclear waste is what I was working on. Um, and I had planned to go back to that. So in the early 2000s, when I decided to do the PhD, the race to map the human genome was on. And I saw a lot of gene talk around the United States. I saw it among indigenous peoples as well. People, and, and also I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a horror movie buff. And I really noticed from like about 1995, um, vampirism, zombie stuff, all of this starts to become a virus. And so what really falls to the background is the devil, Satan and evil. And what comes to the foreground is the potential of science to both create evil and battle that evil. So the priests and the, and the demons are out the door and in come the scientists and they're both good and evil. So this is really interesting. This is happening in the mid to late nineties. And this is around the time that they're talking about mapping the human genome. That's when I go back and decide to do that work. So as gene talks on the, cre in, on the increase across the US, popular understandings of identity have consistently engaged those kinds of ideas in the last two decades. So witness the Elizabeth Warren DNA testing debacle in October, 2018, when she released her Native American DNA test results uh, done by a famous scientist associated with the company 23andMe, who's also at Stanford. And at that time, the Cherokee Nation Secretary of State, she claimed to be Cherokee, myself, Cherokee genealogists, were some of the only real prominent critics uh, of Elizabeth Warren. And we were widely quoted in the press critiquing her damage to tribal sovereignty and tribal definitions of belonging that don't rely on those kinds of DNA tests alone. So Warren is just one famous case during a year, this is 2018, in which the same number of people purchased genetic ancestry tests, as did in all previous years combined since the direct-to-consumer tests came on the market in the early 2000s. So from like 2002 to 2017, the same number of people engaged in genetic ancestry testing as did in 2018. A big upsurge. So settler narratives of immigration, primordial race, and nation are co-constituted with genome research on human migrations and population history. So science, both academic and within the commercial industry, is performed by humans conditioned by certain philosophies and historical standpoints and not others. Elizabeth Warren's genomic proof loops back to reinforce settler historical claims and kinship norms. There are those claims and kinship norms are both embedded in the science that happened uh, 
that was then on, on Native American bodies and histories that was then commercialized, packaged and sold online in the form of a DNA test to kind of go back and reinforce those norms that it, that it is born out of. This all happens at the expense of indigenous philosophies governance and kinship norms. And so let's move on to the critical polyamorist. Uh, that blog was another attempt to survive. So what I realized in doing the PhD work is that I'm a de facto anthropologist of white people. And I always had been. So even though I thought I was working on tribal environmental policy and working in support of tribal governance, I was always studying the cultural norms of white people. And I grew up doing that in order to survive. And, and indigenous people, black people, other people of color will say, we don't only need to understand our own histories and norms, we need to understand the norms and histories of hegemonic whiteness, right? In order to survive in that society, and I had always been doing that. Um, so when I began to write The Critical Polyamorist, I really quickly understood that polyamory was just another form of settler sexuality, which I'll define in a minute. And doing that blog was another attempt to survive and to push back against settler colonial narratives and definitions of relations, uh, a way to push back against what the world is and how it should be. At first, the new turn in my personal life and research interests seemed unrelated to my previous work uh, in the research of DNA politics, but as I have come to find out, and you may have too, pretty much everything's related. So foregrounding my indigenous analytical frameworks and my own Dakota sense of relations, the critical polyamory work now focuses on what I have come to understand as a settler sexuality, marriage, and family. So Native American DNA rescripted definitions of individual identity and peoplehood away from essentially genomic definitions that focus on lineal inheritance of properties co-constituted with settler stories. That's what I attempted to do in my book, was push back against those settler definitions, norms, and kinship structures. And this newer work attempts to rescript bodily practices and kinship understandings away from settler definitions and narratives that likewise privilege the inheritance of properties and property and that are grounded in what Scott Morganson calls settler sexuality. So when I talk about settler sexuality, I take that from a settler scholar, a queer theory scholar, Scott Morganson at Queens University, um, who has uh, published a lot on this concept. And I'll just recap it for those that may not be familiar. So Scott Morganson says that settler sexuality is the quote, heteropatriarchal and sexual modernity, exemplary of white settler civilization. He also, uh, describes it in another article as a white national heteronormativity and increasingly homonormativity, he writes on that too, that regulates indigenous sexuality and gender by supplanting them with the sexual modernity of settler subjects. Uh, he writes about how settler colonialism has conditioned the formation of modern sexuality in the US and I assume we can say Canada too. There are feminist historians that write on the, the similarities between the two countries. Um, it's conditioned the formation of modern sexuality, including modern queer subjects and politics. So uh, what I have sort of worked out in my work, um, and I think Morgan said, it's been a while since I've read him, uh, but that settler sexuality and family are really closely linked to concepts of property, both pro and we inherit different kinds of property. We inherit biological properties and settler forms of kinship and relationality focus, I think, over-focus on the inheritance of biological properties, but we also inherit material property, economic property, right? And so my charge is that settler sexuality, family, and kinship are really closely linked to both forms of property. In fact, I, would, I make the claim in this paper, I think that settler relations are property. So the other thing I do in that paper is I compare uh, genetic genealogists, so the people that take the genetic ancestry test to critical polyamorists. And I, and I talk about my different relationships with those two bodies of research subjects. So ge genetic genealogists, so family tree researchers who use DNA tests to fill in the gaps in their family trees, um, have I have studied them in a more contentious way because I was against their project. So that's one difference versus the critical polyamorous are people who write me and talk to me about why they're pursuing polyamory, but they're attempting to do it in a way where they're not reinforcing settler sexuality, where they're not reinforcing settler ways of relating. Uh, they don't necessarily call themselves critical polyamorous. That's what I call them. And I come to that term for a very simple reason. I also bring critical race theory into my work. Um, and so I'm thinking, I'm thinking about non-monogamy or polyamory or other forms of non-monogamy as a way to have relationships that's an implicit, if not explicit, critique of the settler state. Um, 
my friend and colleague, Angela Willie, who wrote the book Undoing Monogamy. I think it's, it's on Duke University Press, I think 2016 maybe. Uh, Angie says that to be queer is to be against the state. I think to be indigenous should be to be against the state as well, but there are probably, uh, there's other indigenous thinkers who would probably uh, disagree with me about that. I don't think everybody always thinks about queerness as being against the state. And I really, that, that has really resonated with me. And I think about that a lot um, when I think about that term. So now I'm just going to read a quick paragraph to you that, that is my, basically my critique of the term identity. And so if you go back to the title of this paper, I say that identity is a poor substitute for relations. And I'm really getting allergic to that word because I think it, I think we don't always use it meaning the same thing. I think it's very confusing. I think it's misleading for us in many ways. And I think it emphasizes property over actual ongoing relating, which is a much more difficult project, I think. So identity as a concept in popular usage does not necessarily imply ongoing relating. It might imply discrete biological conjoinings within one's genetic ancestry and it can spur alliances. So say you take a DNA test and you find out online that you've got a distant cousin and you would only have known through that DNA connection, you might actually make kin with that cousin, but it's not necessarily uh, for a foregone conclusion that you will. Um, but these biological conjoinings can also exist as a largely individualistic idea, as something considered to be held once and for all, unchanging within one's own body, whether through biological or social imprinting as one's body's property. Similarly, I don't want our polyamorous relating to calcify into individual identity claims that risk us looking too much within our own persons, including our genetics, for a definition of who we are. Rather, I want us to remember the, that we are always becoming in relation not only to genetic and cultural ancestors, and those are not always synonymous, our genetic and cultural ancestors, uh, but to one another continuously and in relation to the geographies and political economies we inhabit, whether by choice or by circumstances that we may have had little choice in. If we remember that we are what we become as much or more than we are who our properties determine us to be, I suspect that will help us focus on how to relate more carefully with one another as beings in the world, both within and beyond romantic relations. We might thus weigh our relating more toward the good, although relations that are not necessarily good are also the entangled relations that make and remake us into what we are. So I don't have some naive idea that all my relatives are people or non-humans that I like. That's not true. They are my relatives and relations nonetheless. And we have to think about how to relate as best we can together. So I'm not being all romantic and you know rose-colored glasses about when I use the word relationality. It can be a very difficult thing. I've also more recently become really critical of the concept of the citizen. Um, I realize because that's all about exclusion. Um, my, I refuse to see my horizon of freedom anymore along the lines of redeeming the settler state, be that the US or Canada. And again, I'm always going back to relations and relational frameworks, which are really coming to the fore in global critical indigenous studies right now. So that's kind of the framework that's underlying my move from DNA to uh, non-monogamy. Um, and also in between there, I worked on multi-species relations, new materialisms, indigenous materialism. So there's a lot that comes up if we wanna think relations for all of us across the disciplines and across different sectors of society. So that's my intro. I hope I didn't go too long. Oh, that was amazing. And uh, the, the length was great. I'm happy to take questions from the chat now. Um, I will start with Evan and Amber whichever one of you would like to unmute on behalf of the two of you and ask your question, we would love to hear it. Yeah, that one is specifically my question. So I'll, I'll just read what I wrote in the chat. Um, so I would like to know your thoughts on a feeling that I have of cultural homelessness. So my parents are not married to each other, never have been, because they reject the property model of relationality that you described. I myself am polyamorous, and I also reject most of the things that you hear described as settler conceptions of relationality and power and economy. I'm also Lily White with white ancestors who settled the South in the 1500s. And so I have no place in the culture of my genetic ancestors, but I'm also wary of culturally appropriative ways of relating to other cultures. And yet I long for a cultural home. So I'm curious about your thoughts or suggestions for people like me in similar boats. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think about that, right? And I think about that predicament and 
but you know, I'm the exact person who can't answer that in some ways, right? So I wonder, because I do feel, I mean, I grew up in Dakota homelands, quote unquote, um, and with a strong sense of that history um, and the words and actions of my ancestors actually shaping what I did. So I, I wonder if there are other people who are in your same position who have who, who have grappled with that. I mean, this is so I spoke at a, um, at a conference a few years ago that was on displacement disasters and refugee stuff. And I'm, what I'm about to say has a slippery slope because it can lead into appropriation, but I think we have to have these conversations even with that being the risk. And I think about this with, with uh, I have a very good friend, a very, very good friend from Appalachia. And, and I listen to the way she talks about, she's a white woman, the way she talks about their relationships to place and to earth and to medicines and to the forest and the mountains. Um, I think it's really important to, to figure out how to relate with the people and the non-humans that are in a place and really figure out how to build those relations. And so, but I realized that in attempting to build really intimate relations with peoples and place um, and staking your, your stand there, choosing to stand with those peoples in that place, if you're not historically or for a long time from that place, you could be accused of cultural appropriation. So I think I get what the challenge is and what the, what the predicament is, right? That you want to do that work of relating, but you're also really leery of appropriation. Um, and I, you know, I, all I can give you is examples of people who I've, that I've seen do these things without appropriating, but I can't really give you a sort of reasoned out system of how they do it. I think a lot about the people, like there are non-native people who have lived in my community, who come into the community where I come from, they've, they've either been mostly white, but sometimes black. Um, and they just live among the people, you know, they, they might start a business there or build a home there. They go to school with people. They can't vote in our elections, you know, because we don't do citizenship like that yet, but they just live there quietly and they learn and they interact and they're respectful relations, even though they would never make a claim to be a Dakota person. And they're really quietly accepted, um, but they're very quiet. That's the other thing they don't speak for. Uh, they listen and learn a lot. In fact, the medicine man who works for my family, and this is not something that, I mean, maybe I shouldn't talk about it publicly, but again, I think we need to have these conversations. The medicine man who works with my family brings non-native people sometimes into his sweat lodge and into his circle and teaches them things. But I notice how he chooses them. They're quiet, they don't speak for, they would never commercialize or sell anything. They're humble people. Um, there to serve the community. And I don't know, maybe it requires a, a more quiet kind of constitution and sense of humility um, than you would be able to have if you were somebody from the community. But I, I see people doing it. Um, and I don't think we have these conversations enough about how people do this um, and, and what kind of people do this best. But um, in short, it requires doing the work and not necessarily always being lauded for it or named for it or put out front for it. If that makes sense. Thank you. That was very helpful. Okay, good. Do you have any follow up, Evan? Not really. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I I felt really grateful for the way that Evan asked a question that was from his own experience, and so uh, having been inspired by that, I'd like to follow suit and say that. I, I identify as a queer woman and I do practice polyamory in my relationships. So in my research of you prior to this event, I was really uh, excited about your critiques of um, polyamory and queerness that is practiced without this colonial lens and how it doesn't really escape often the, the structures that are imposed by settler sexuality. So I was wondering if you could expand on that for everybody. Yeah, and I have to say, like, I'm still working this out in the next book that I'm writing, right? Because it's not like I can just draw from my ancestors' practices. We don't get to live like that anymore. Although I can take core um, orientations to the world, you know, um, and figure out how we can uh, build upon those in a contemporary society. But I've really also learned so much from and felt a lot of resonance with relationship anarchy literature, right? Which I also need to dig more deeply into. And I've said this many times recently, I learn a lot from 
uh, people who kind of cross over between more critical polyamory practice or actually identify as relationship anarchists. Um, and also from people that identify as asexual. And you know, we get into all these, of course, these labels and categories that we have to have in, in a settler world, but 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 I find that asexual polyamorous are people that that think a lot about what I call relating. They're not fetishizing sexuality in their forms of relating. They really are thinking about relating. And, and sex, what we call sex, might be an option, but it's it doesn't have to be, right? Um, so did I forget, what was your question again? It was about, <laughs> sorry. Just about, about how a lot of polyamorous practice doesn't escape the imposed structures. It's just kind of like amplified monogamy. Um, and, and same with the, the way that there's a homonormativity that, that uh, can keep queerness from being against the state too. Yeah, actually, uh, Alexis Shotwell has an article in a philosophy uh, special volume. Do, do, have you read that one where she basically, she says polyamory is monogamy on steroids? She, Alexa Shot, well, she's a feminist philosopher, probably a bunch of you in here have read her if you're into this philosophy group. Um, but yeah, totally, right? It's monogamy on steroids with the, you know, upping the rules and, you know, everything like that. Um, but that's where in non-settler communities, I have found the most resonance with the re relationship anarchy literature. And again, I'm not, I'm not an anarchist. I probably have a lot in common with them, but I haven't read or studied them enough to know how much I have in common. Uh, I... I have a sense that, I mean, I know that their antagonism towards the state is as great as my antagonism towards the state, I think, but it's coming out of a different standpoint, right? And so it makes sense that they're, they're um, you know, the, the, the ongoing negotiation of, of agreements, right? Not being anti-rule and really more about the agency of all of the individuals involved in a configuration of relationships, I think. So um, this is, I'm still very much in formation in terms of my thinking on this, but yeah, I, I I don't, polyamory is not the answer to settler sexuality, but there is a way in which some more critical polyamorous, I think, are making a critique of the state, even though they may not necessarily understand that's what they're doing. We, we have a question in the chat, actually, uh, that someone's asked me to read uh, from someone who does identify as a relationship anarchist. And uh, they say they're very critical of hierarchical relating based on societal norms and relationship escalators, et cetera. And they would love to hear more about how you feel relationship anarchy relates to your ideas around settler sexuality. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, I think I think it, you know, again, I've got, I'd have to go through like a whole list of relationship anarchist principles, but I really, okay, I'm gonna say something here that's gonna be in my next book that's kind of controversial because I really wanna deal with this. Um, I'm redefining fidelity in my work away from, so whatever the dictionary definition, it's something like random indiscriminate, you know, um, random indiscriminate relations, that kind of thing. So I want to really problematize that and look at different definitions of promiscuity and different definitions of fidelity. Oh, it's promiscuity. That was the definition of promiscuity. And I want to redefine fidelity away from these kinds of property claims that we make on our lovers and our relationships, right, and on our land. Um, and so uh, what was I going to say about the relationship anarchy? One of the things that's really interesting to me when I read through some of the literature is the refusal to enforce others' agreements, right? Um, because of my age, I'm in my early 50s, and because I look and appear so mainstream, I get a lot of people, a lot of very mainstream, heteronormative and monogamous people that approach me quietly and, at, and, and say, I wish, I wish, I wish that I didn't have to live like this. I wish I could do this, but I just can't, right? A lot of people, especially in my age, who've been married for a long time, uh, who have been very normative for a long time, whether they're straight or not, cannot simply walk away from all that. Um, and so there's a whole lot of cheating that goes on out there, more so than open marriages, a lot. It's easier, and I understand actually, I've come to the point now as a, most polyamorous aren't like this, where I get it. Having left my marriage, I'm not sure that I did less damage and caused less hurt being honest, because <laughs> I had to be, you know, because I valued that so much than somebody who's attempting to maintain. And there are different cultural um, 
different cultures have different ways of judging infidelity. Um, it's not the same around the world, the way that these things are judged and dealt with. It, the, the, what is considered moral and amoral in relationship to infidelity is not the same across cultures and space. So I really want to deal with that um, in my definition. And so the, one of the things I've read in relationship anarchy is the refusal to enforce others' agreements, including um, not necessarily being anti-cheating. You know, and so I want to really want to dig down into all these terms that we're using, and and I think so. In some ways, I think I'm kind of, um, I don't know, but a relationship anarchist. I actually anybody who's RA maybe at the end can tell me how I'm resonating with what they're doing and overlapping. They might know better than me by the end of this. So because this is still a body of research that I've got to dig into, but it, that's my early sense that there's a lot there that's overlapping with my sense of the world. Uh, thanks so much. Um, the The next question I'd like to hear is Laura's. Would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Hey there. Hi, Kim. I um, Hi, love following your uh, your Twitter feed. So <laughs> I like seeing you talking in person too. And I, as an anarchist, I I welcome you as an anarchist as well. I think it fits really well. Um, I'm coming at this as a clinical psychologist working from a critical framework of the ideological positions of my field. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to the libidinal drive that might underscore settler colonial claims to the land, which feels to me like a sexualization that ends up being disavowed or sublimated into ownership. Things like it belongs to me, it's mine to do what I want with it. Um, and then it might get to the question you're saying about citizenship, you know, Ariella Atzulay has, has talked about this in the context of settler colonialism in Israel, um, uh, Palestine really, but settler colonial Israeli state um, about citizenship as being exclusionary. But it feels to me like there's a sexualization process that's there. And I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you have anything um, to flesh out about. Well, I'd love citations from you on that because I haven't, I don't use the term libidinal drive. I mean, I could, right, I guess. Um, I have another paper I'm almost done with that comes out of a talk that I, that I was giving called Settler Love is Breaking My Heart. And I decided to reorganize that talk because I'm a country music fan because again, I've always been an anthropologist. It's like the ultimate settler colonial music, right? It's like all I listen to. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm even doing anthropology on white people that way. But I started to pepper the talk with set, with, with country music lyrics. And I noticed, um, you know, and I and I can I have some vast catalog in my head of lyrics I can draw on because literally that's almost all I listen to. And I noticed that um, I wish I had the paper in front of me, that the way that especially straight white men who do country sing about the land, I do think there's more, I do think. So I can, this is partly why I can resonate it with, and they talk about moving through areas of the South, you know, and I like the prairies, I'm a prairie person. When they talk about moving through those landscapes and I've lived, worked or traveled in all but one state of the United States, I know those places. I understand a deep love that not just indigenous people, but many people who have been really tied to land have for that place, right? But I notice that the way that they talk about the land is the way they talk about women, right? It's very, very property, very, I'd have to go back into the paper again, but that's actually something I'm working out through my analysis of country music lyrics in relationship to the settler sexuality literature. And it's a very academic paper, but then I'm just bringing in these lyrics and I'm trying to figure out how to move between the boring academic way of writing and then the creative nonfiction that is bringing in the country music stuff. Um, so I would totally love citations if there's anything you think I should read um, because it's a connection I'm just beginning to make now. Um, but I, but I, I did want to say, like, I, like my friend, well, Beth Steven, she's with Annie Sprinkle, that's her wife, they do the ecosexuality stuff. Beth is from uh, Appalachia, and she's got a film on mountaintop removal, Goodbye Golly Mountain, and Beth talks about the medicine knowledge that white people, that poor white hillbillies have in that area. I don't downplay that or dismiss that. You know, I love when human, non-human kind of co-knowledge production come and it's not only indigenous people that can do that others can do that too um so i want to like recognize that and respect that while also asserting that that people need to respect indigenous people's um claims here which is not a great word anyway but um yeah totally i think i'm thinking about it i'm just not you know where you are with that particular literature probably 
these are such like good questions. I feel like I'm being very um, all over the place with my answers. <laughs> Uh, I'm so glad. I'm loving the questions too. So I'm glad that uh, you feel the same way. Uh, Chanel, I think, has a question that will feed uh, from where we just were in the conversation. Chanel, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Sure. Yeah. Um, hi there, Dr. Talver. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to get enough light in here. Um, hi, my name is Chanel. I am in Toronto and um, heard about your talk from a fellow sex work activist. Um, it's something that I am writing about and I'm really curious about your thoughts on right now, hearing you, uh, hearing you talk just sparked some thinking about some research I'm doing on the relationship between um, enforced monogamy in our immigration policies mm -hmm. and xenophobia. Um, because, you know, I hear a lot of polyamorous talk about, well, you know, how uh, discriminatory it feels that uh, marriage law restricts marriage to two individuals. Um, but I've never actually seen anyone link that to the fact that the, the if the state were to change that, it would change the eligibility of immigrants from places where typically it's, it's polygamy is either legal or widely practiced, all of which are countries in Asia or Africa. And I've never seen that put together in the conversation about relationship anarchy or polyamory mm -hmm. is how, and sorry, I should also say, I'm not deeply read in this. So <laughs> when I say I haven't seen it, it's not because it isn't in there, but I just want to, to get your thoughts on it. Is that something that, um, that you've explored in your work? Cause I'd love to learn more about it, about the ways that, you know, those, those two conversations at least in popular culture, always seems so separated between, you know, xenophobic immigration policies mm -hmm. and our, we should be able to run our romantic lives and our, our love lives, you know, love is love. And yeah. yet it seems to me that there's a connection between the two of them. And I'd just love to know what you think about that. I think a lot of uh, mainstream polyamorous will try to distinguish between themselves and polygamy, right? And so when I've given talks about critical polyamory, when I first started doing it about five years ago, uh, I a lot, well, even now, I, the critique I get is from white feminists who are afraid of polygamy and even some like indigenous feminists. It's always been in feminists usually, yeah, and I'm a feminist, but like um, there's a desire to distinguish between good non-monogamy and bad non-monogamy, right? Totally. Uh, Nathan Rambukana, who is, I think, at Wilfrid Laurier, um, he's got a book called Fraught Intimacies, and I think he's South Asian. He um, talks about some of these policy things, right? And I think he probably talks about uh, uh, polygamy and, and if not immigration, at least the xenophobia stuff. So that's a really good book, Fraught Intimacies by Nathan Rambakana. I need to do more research into this as well, because this is coming up. There's also a report um, you know, because polyamory was technically legalized, I guess, in Canada. I haven't read into the policy literature very much, but I think they're probably dealing with it at that level. But that's not something that, if it comes up in the mainstream polyamorous relationship stuff, it's usually, we're not them. You know, I come from a polygamous culture, historically. My four greats grandfather, uh, who was a very important person in our, in our Dakota history, who actually fled to Canada in the war of 1862 and then went back and got murdered. Um, he had four wives. And so it was, you know, I, I really want to dig into that as well, because I think our ways of doing marriage, the divorce was flexible. Women were not the property of men in the same way. So I think this idea that polygamy automatically translates into women being the property of men, that was not the case in my culture. So I am, I'm not saying it's not the case in those other cultures, but I'm definitely open to learning because I know that my own culture gets misrepresented, right? So yeah, there's a lot of work I think to be done around that and the non-critical polyamorous are not gonna do it. Like they really just wanna keep arm's length from those backwards cultures, <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for the mention of fraught intimacies, actually. I remember that uh, yeah. hearing about that book a few years ago, actually, because I think the author got in hot water for doing something like lightly anti-racist in his classroom or something like that. And Oh, no, it was he was the professor of Lindsay Shepard, that TA that. Oh, um, that. Oh, what's yeah. his face? Was, uh, what's his name? Was, uh, you know, the guy that talks was, like Kermit. Wasn't it Jordan Peterson? 
yeah, oh yeah so jordan paper. peterson took her side on that uh, right she, that was it like, yeah was um, she like yeah. her for something yeah something about that but yeah thank you for the tip on that i'm gonna <laughs> that's super helpful and and yeah. i and i think yeah you raised the the whole point about the idea that monogamy is like inherently feminist or something like that there's no property relation in monogamy is ridiculous as well so thank you doctor uh hannah I, i'd love if you could ask your question i know it's up in the chat so just let me know if you need me to paste it in there again i got it I'm prepared. Hi, uh, so I am really curious to hear you expand on your process to creating or piecing together uh, sentful non-monogamy. And how, how are you either designing or finding ways of doing that that work for you? I'm sorry, what did you say before non-monogamy? You had an adjective I didn't hear. Uh, consentful. So how do I do, yeah. do, do non-monogamy or how do I write about it? I guess, um, what is your process for uh, figuring out how you are doing non-monogamy? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. Like, can you give me, like if I said something that that your um, that question is in relationship to, it's a, uh, it's a really big question, so I'm not understanding yeah. it totally. I think everyone has their own sort of rules about um, this is how I do poly, this is how I do non-monogamy, this is you know what works for me. I do hierarchical, I do non-hierarchical, and so on and so forth. So I'm wondering, you know, are there maybe concepts that we haven't heard about because it's uh, maybe from Dakota culture, or uh, maybe you're creating your own brand new um, sort of guiding principles. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, do I have print? I mean, I'm, I know what I, I know the labels I wouldn't take. I mean, I'm not even really comfortable with polyamory anymore. Um, but I just haven't done the research to figure out if any of the other labels work better for me. Um, so I do tend to default to the neutral consensual non-monogamy. Um, but I'm also sympathetic to relationship anarchist ideas that are um, not, I, I am unwilling to monitor the agreements of, of my other partners. I will say that I, I do have base, I, feel, I, I have a really strong ethical framework that governs how I act. It just may not be everybody else's ethical framework. I'm very non-interventionist and which I, I re also comes out of my culture. I, I scream inside sometimes when I allow, not allow because my daughter just turned 18, but when I, I just al allow her to, I, will, I, I don't curtail her even when I think it's dangerous sometimes. And that kind of comes out of my culture. I really don't want to infringe upon her autonomy. Um, but at the same time, I bow down before her. And if she needs me, I'm there in an instant. I don't re expect reciprocity necessarily from her yet, right? Like I'm 100% there for her um, when she needs me. But I, I'm also like, you, you don't owe me anything, you go. You know, that's maybe that's a parent thing. Um, but I also am thinking even with like my partners, I want to know everything. I mean, I'm curious, I'm a curious person. I want to know everything. And I think I have a lot of compersion. I don't struggle a lot with jealousy, but I do not believe that I have a right to know everything. I do not believe in radical openness and honesty. If you wanna give me that, but I believe people's stories belong to them. I believe it's a gift when somebody shares their story with me. It's a gift when they open up and tell me their private thoughts and I want to hear them, but they don't owe me that. That's not part of the agreement that I would ever make. And, I, and I'm, while I'm a blabbermouth and I am really open about my life, I don't think that I owe that to my partners either. So I don't know, is that a basic principle? Um, I think extreme honesty is really, really nice, but there are many good reasons for why people don't do that. And, uh, I, res I try to respect that as well. I do think in the end, this is probably maybe why I am kind of cut out for RA as far as I understand it. Um, 
I'm, I'm really respectful of autonomy, but at the same time, I also see RA people building collectivities, working together, building relations. So I think while a lot of the relationship anarchists that I listen to f overly focus on this language of autonomy, that's there. But I think what they don't bring up enough is how they're so much better at working as a collective than th a lot of us who think that we're not as, um, who, who don't think we're as autonomous, right? Who think that we're more enmeshed. In fact, I see relationship anarchists constantly working on, and maybe anarchists beyond that, working on these good relations. So I, um, I think I'm coming back to the idea that maybe some of their ways of balancing collectivity and relationality with autonomy is probably a core set of values for me too, if that answers the question a little bit. I think what I got from your response is something like a lot of what goes into your design of, you know, this is the what works for me and how I want to do uh, sexual and or romantic relating is from your personal values as a human being, from some of your inherited values culturally, and from your research as well. Is that accurate? Mm hmm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I thought I had the question and then I lost it in the chat. Um, sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna ask a question actually. Uh, I'm curious about um, how you, how you address like, I, I feel maybe like this is not the, the gentlest way to put it, but like failed polyamorous. I know a lot of people who have tried polyamory and found that the, the programming of monogamy like was almost like an impenetrable barrier for them psychologically. And so they couldn't escape to a different form of relating. Um, do, you, do you have any um, just compassion or advice or anything that you respond to people who bring you those kinds of stories? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, again, given my age, uh, you know, I think, I think young people, you know, we didn't have all the terms. <laughs> we were so gender binary, right? We, most of us thought that marriage was just what you did. Even people like me who were pretty progressive, um, monogamy was what you did. And if you didn't do monogamy, you like snuck around or had friends with benefit. Like we just didn't have the level of language that there is now. So I think I hope for younger people, there's um, more of an ability to not be bound by the monogamous conditioning. But certainly for people in my generation, um, I do have a lot of sympathy. I mean, I've dated multiple people in open marriages and I've thought about, I think I've, I've had fairly serious relationships with at least six people who opened their marriage. And two of them, uh, these were all straight couples or maybe, well, not all, some of them were bisexual, but they were, they were opposite sex couples, but some of them might've been bisexual. Um, two, the husbands decided they couldn't deal and went back to monogamy Two, the wives decided they couldn't deal and went back to mon they went back to monogamy. Um, yeah, so they closed their marriages, or there were people that got divorced. Uh, so it, it, there's only one person, and I'm still in a relationship with him, but I can't see him because he's in Texas, and I'm quite close to his wife. And they are the only one out of the six couples in their 40s and 50s who successfully have opened their marriage. Um, and it's been a really, it's been a struggle for them, but it's because they were both on board. Unlike a lot of people who open marriages, they're not both equally on board. They were both on board for different reasons. Um, but it's, I totally get it. I mean, I've been with people who I watch them struggle or their partners struggle. And, you know, when you have a, a home and a family together and finances and you're raising, it's just, it's, it's like what I said, it was me leaving my marriage less painful and destructive than any of these other scenarios, right? So yeah, I, I do meet people who say, oh, I'll never date a newbie, you know, I'll never, I'm like, I, I was like that for two seconds. I'm like, if I don't date newbies to non-monogamy at my age, I, there's not gonna be anybody because I'm not interested in somebody who's 30, you know, like I'm not, um, I like old people. <laughs> so so yeah, um, that was that your whole question? I, yeah, I, I, I have sympathy, I do. And um, 
even I have monogamy hangovers. Like even I, it, cause it's, it's wet in the property claims. It's all deeply sewn into every fabric of our society. And you catch yourself, you know, like, oh my God, that was such a monogamous thing I just thought or did, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that especially touched me just that, that you would share that even you writing about this and researching about it all the time, like still get that little weird voice in your head that talks like a settler like that, that makes me feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> show you had a question if, if, if it's too far back in the chat, just let me know and I'll paste it for you. But if not, uh, you could unmute it and ask. There's so many comments. Thank you. That's so nice for the engagement. Thank you. Uh, I'm not hearing from show. So uh, while while we're waiting to see if they're around, I'll I'll read one in the chat that's been asked uh, for me to read it for them. Uh, they ask, Dr. Tallbear, can you share some of the positive and difficult experiences you've had raising a child uh, while transitioning away from monogamy? Yeah, it was, um, I would think my daughter was 10 or 11 when her dad and I separated and um, he's, he's a totally lefty feminist. He's the first person I told besides maybe my closest girlfriends in Austin, because I did this when I was in Austin, Texas, and he and I have actually never legally divorced. We're still legally married because neither of us cares. So I don't think we're going to get married again. And we don't both are bad at paperwork and we still share money and we're friends. We write together. We have a very amicable relationship. But um, I told him first and because I wanted to make sure because my daughter was coming to stay with me for the summer and she would meet a partner or two. And I wanted to be sure that he was OK with it. Um, and he said, yes, of course, I trust you. I'm really lucky, like because I also know people my age who can't be out about their non-monogamy because they're worried about custody and, you know, terrible things. That was never the case with me. Um, uh, what we, oh, the child thing. Yeah. So, but my daughter, you know, even though she was raised by two academics who were anti-racist, who are feminist, who are very progressive, we talk openly about sexuality and race and everything in our home. We did when we were, to, when we were together, and we still do when we get together. She was really freaked out by my non-monogamy from the ages of about ten to fourteen. She just turned eighteen. Um, and that was really hard because it's so it doesn't matter like you can be the most progressive open honest family in your household the rest of society makes such a huge impact on who your your children are right um but then i i came out one day when she was about i think 13 or 14 it was a few years into it and i saw her on zoom uh or whatever skype telling her little friend back in Virginia where her dad was, they were having a visit that day, the difference between swinging and polyamory. And I was like, babe, don't do that. I'm gonna get in trouble with that other parent, you know? Um, she's good now. And one of the things I remember, I took her to um, Norway with me. I was giving a talk with some Sami people and we were having a kind of a circle and people were talking. I can't remember what the topic was, but Carmen, everybody was going around and sharing and Carmen raised her hand and she said, can I share? And she was like, I think 15 at the time. And she said, it was really hard for me at first when my mom told me she was non-monogamous. I didn't get it and I was really upset. I thought that's why my parents' marriage broke up. And, and she said, but now I realize that I move between all these different groups of people. I have friends that are in this clique and friends that do this and friends that do that. And I, and I can do that because my mom was polyamorous because she taught me I didn't have to choose, that I could have relations with many different kinds of people. And even though she said at the time, I think I'm a monogamist, I'm very, she didn't use the word promiscuous. So that's kind of what she meant. I'm very kind of promiscuous or polyamorous with my friends. Um, so that was really nice, but it took a few years. It was really hard, really hard. Thanks so much for, for sharing that with us. Uh, this is gonna be our last question. So for anybody who's got questions in the chat that I didn't get to, I'm so sorry. Maybe we'll have to ask for Dr. Tallbear to come back there's, sometime. There's great comments in the chat. I love them. Thank you. The country music stuff. <laughs> no horror stuff. Um, so I'll end on on show's question. I'm going to read it for them. Um, they say they're curious about the use of the term non-human. Much of colonial thought 
is rooted in dualistic reasoning rather than more integrative terms. And much of their own approach to relating has come from a place of working towards being more integrative and non-dualistic uh, on all levels, including their relations with nature. So they're just curious what, what that distinction means for you between human and non-human. Well, I don't like the word non-human, but I use it because if I just say my relations, people might think I only mean close biological human relatives. Um, but yeah, working in the academic literature, yeah, non-human is not, my, my grad students are using more than human. Um, I would just use relations. In my culture, we talk about, um, you know, relations that have different amounts of legs and things like that, right? But, you know, um, I do think it's a bad word. I don't think it's a great word at all. But I think we're operating in English that is full of these binaries, right? And so we struggle. And that's why we get this kind of obscure theoretical language too, because built into the language are, are concepts and ideas that are really hard to get around without very contorted language. Um, but yes, if I was in a community of people who understood that when I said relations, I don't only mean my close biological relatives. I mean, my lovers, my child, the lizard who lives in my plant, right? I mean, all of those. I mean, rocks and stars. So, but that seems a bit too open. So yeah, non-human is not the best word. I agree. It centers humans too, right? Yeah. So good luck finding language that works. And <laughs> I encourage people to play with it. I think that's really fun, right? Yeah, we definitely love playing with language here at the Stoic community. It's one of our favorite activities. Um, and I will uh, tag Peer back in. Thank you so much, Dr. Tallbear, for being here. Uh, this has been an absolutely su such an alive conversation for, for everybody here. So I'm just really, really grateful. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. I really, really appreciate it. Beautiful. And I will uh, send you the, the, the chats if you like at the end, uh, Kim. If, yes, uh, please. Yeah. Because uh, there's many and I can't read them all. So I'll make some closing announcements in a moment. But uh, Kim, uh, thank you so much for coming to uh, the STOA. Maybe thanks for emceeing. Uh, wonderful job today. Um, and so I'll plug a couple of events that are coming up at the STOA. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, the Willow Branch of the Monastic Academy. Um, it's a launch party tomorrow. Yasna's coming in. That's 1.30 uh, p.m. Eastern time. Quite excited for that. Um, and uh, we have some facilitators here. Tyson, would you like to uh, plug your event on Sunday? Sure, thank you. My event on Sunday is Flowing with Unknowingness. We practice freestyle rap and spoken word as a way of deepening our relationship with uncertainty, developing relationships, and it's a fun and playful space to explore creative expression and language and words. So I hope to see you there. I'll drop a link to RSVP in the chat. Cool. Thank you, Tyson. Uh, Aaron, you want to uh, plug your raw shadow uh, or series? It's not raw shadow. It's what, what is it? Shadow play or shadow play? Right. Um, every Friday in the month of November at 6 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to be playing with the shadow, doing some experimental games with shadow work and trying to get into the right relationship with the banished self, you might say. So we just had one uh, two hours ago, it went really well, it was really fun. And I hope to see you guys at the next one. And maybe I gotta take you in to talk about your new series being launched at the STOA called Dear Maybe. Uh, do you wanna briefly plug that? Yeah, is it even on the website yet? Or is this the first no, time you're hearing of it? No, this is a big reveal right now. Oh, so exciting. Yeah, we're launching a series called Dear Maybe where I will be fully embodying my live Zoom call sex columnist role. Uh, we're gonna find a way to take some juicy stories from your, from your intimate lives and uh, unpack them and play with them as a community and see if we can grow together and, and bring that home to our relationships. I am so excited about it. So excited, so excited, so excited. So please keep an eye on the website for that. It'll be, I'm sure, announced very soon. Beautiful. Uh, so sto.ca to check out more events. We've got tons of events coming up. We have a Patreon and then uh, a Substack for daily updates. So that being said, uh, Kim, uh, maybe everyone, thank you so much for coming to the store.